Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ambassador at Large, Hellenic Republic, Ambassador Yana Angelopoulos. Young people have the power to move the world forward. And the work you just saw in that video is proof. The greatest gift cannot be measured by dollars, cannot be measured even by hours. The greatest gift you can give to someone, especially a young person, is hope. When I first came to CGI back in 2010, I had served my country in office. I had organized the 2004 Athens Olympics, and I had raised my three children. But President Clinton taught me that whatever chapter in our life we are in, we have more to offer. We have more to accomplish. And I saw the action and the aspiration in CGI, and I wanted to plant these seeds back in my own country. So I started the Angelopoulos CGI U Fellowship Program. <laughs> and at a time when Greek headlines they were about despair and crisis. I wanted to put the ideas of young Greeks in action, in motion. I have to tell you, in our first year, I worried that we wouldn't have any applicants. By now, we have to count more than 1,000. And as you show, you've seen a little bit, but they are running organizations to increase much needed voluntary blood donations, bone marrow donations. They are creating device to help people with disabilities, maps 3D for the city for blind men and women. They use drones to improve agriculture. One of our students launched for the first time a mobile laundry. So this laundry is in Athens, downtown for the moment, and helps homeless people and refugees. And they are making this. These phone cases is are, I mean, I have my own here, from Seaweed. One young student one day was swimming, of course, in a beautiful Greek island, and he saw beaches choked with washed up seaweed. So he decided to clean up. He found a lot of supporters, and out of the seaweed, he makes objects, among them, phone cases. I said earlier, I raised and I have, I'm blessed, three children. But soon, I will have 103. <laughs> why? Wait to hear why. Because I'm pleased to announce that today I'll start a new commitment. And this commitment is igniting ideas for Greece's future, the Angelopoulos 100. This commitment will support uh, 100 young Greeks. Uh, it will provide training, help, and support. Why? To start their own enterprises. And training will provide some valuable skills to them, from management and finance, to marketing and evaluation. I will provide seed funding, at least $10,000 for each selected 
project. And later, I will make introductions to other funding sources for them. This commitment will build on our successful pilot. This successful pilot, what it was, were 56 projects targeted and addressed major challenges in Greece. These fellows, they are not living abroad. They are not joining the brain drain. They are not giving up on their country. And I'm not giving up on them. <laughs> Let me finish by saying that for me, CGI has been a wonderful discovery. It was a unique journey. Thank you all for that. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Executive Officer, Last Mile Health, Raj Punjabi. CGI and its members have a proud record, a proud record of accomplishment through our thousands of commitments. But in celebrating CGI's impact in this last final annual meeting, we want to recognize five key areas of achievement. It's what we're calling CGI's legacy themes, and we'll highlight one in each plenary. So this morning, we heard President and Chelsea uh, talk about the crucial role that partnerships have played in strengthening commitments. And I want to share today at the start of this session the broader CGI story of long-term crisis response. Now, I had the chance and the privilege of being born in Liberia in West Africa. But when I was nine years old, civil war devastated our country. We lost what we had, but my family and I were still lucky. We had a chance to escape, and we got resettled in America. I had a chance to pursue my dream of becoming a doctor, and a decade ago, I went back to Liberia and created Last Mile Health, a proud CGI member that has provided health care to thousands of people in my home country's most remote communities. I believe, like many of you, that we are not defined by the crises that strike our lives, we are defined by how we respond to them. And that's a lesson that we've all embraced here. We've proven that lesson again and again and again in the CGI community. Since its inception, Clinton Global Initiative has laid out an approach with partners to focus not only on the immediate response, but actually to create solutions for a more successful, long-term, resilient recovery through investments that last a long time in impacted regions. Two years ago, we faced another crisis in Liberia, Ebola. You'll remember this. Outbreaks were spreading like wildfire all across Liberia and throughout West Africa. We were told back then that there could be as, million, as many as 1.4 million people who could be infected within weeks if we did nothing more. We were told that many of them would die. But CGI responded. Over 27 CGI members rallied together, trained and equipped thousands of frontline health workers, sent over 500 tons of medical supplies to Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and West Africa. These efforts touched the lives of over a million people, especially women and girls who were the frontline caregivers most impacted by this disease. And when some called for a travel ban, to and from West Africa, President Clinton and Chelsea got personally involved. They flew over to Liberia to stand with the frontline health workers while Ebola was still active. If that's not commitment, I don't know what is. Today, Ebola has been brought under control, but our response is not over. Several CGI members are now partnering on initiatives, including the Liberian government's 
historic community health assistant program that's going to create thousands of jobs, 4,000 paid community health workers to reach each and every corner of the country. It's going to help stop the next local outbreak from becoming the next global epidemic. Now, we also know that crises are not unique to West Africa. We've had our share right here in America. One month before the first CGI meeting, Katrina devastated. Hurricane Katrina devastated New Orleans in 2005. The CGI community came together to rebuild the Broadmoor neighborhood. Some of, you, some of you will remember that this community was slated for complete removal. Thanks to CGI partnerships, today Broadmoor is a thriving, productive neighborhood with better schools, jobs, libraries, and there are job opportunities and libraries and schools that have shown us that we are able not just to meet our commitments but exceed them, and that's what happened in New Orleans. As you no doubt heard this morning so passionately and eloquently from President Clinton and Dennis O'Brien, Haiti is a primary example of what happens when all of you as CGI partners have rallied together. After a series of four hurricanes struck the island in 2008, after the earthquake hit in 2010, more than 300 corporations, NGOs, and government entities joined together to make 99 commitments, not only to repair Haiti's infrastructure, but to improve it. And together, those commitment makers have served over 3,700 amputees, built 155 schools, and addressed deforestation and food insecurity issues. They're rebuilding Haiti's tourism industry, complete with new jobs and training for over 300 professionals. Now we know that even today the world faces crises. You hear, you'll hear this afternoon that the scale and depth of the refugee crisis in Syria has placed an unprecedented challenge on host countries in the region and it's required, again, international assistance and response. The country of Jordan, which has generously opened its borders, was one of the first countries to experience the impact. It's estimated that now more than a million Syrian refugees have fled to Jordan. That has placed enormous strain on the healthcare system. However, Jordan has lacked the resources necessary to respond. They've had to replace inadequate medical equipment. Thanks to CGI member commitments, Tens of thousands of dollars are already flowing from workplace giving and other partners have joined together to create business and technology solutions that benefit not only the Syrian refugee community but the economy of Jordan itself. You're going to hear more about the global refugee crisis in this session and in this afternoon. You're also going to learn about how the CGI community is working together to address the issues surrounding the crisis in very innovative and very humane ways. You know, I've been thinking about this being our last CGI meeting. And for any of you who've worked on these crises or lived through them, you know that from the world's toughest places come some of the world's most toughest, most resilient people. And we too are, have been nothing but resilient. So as we think about this being our last meeting at CGI, I want to challenge us. We can still commit. We can still commit to respond to crises, whether it's the Ebola crisis, the refugee crisis, or the everyday crises of poverty and inequality. We can still commit to believe in one another and to believe in each other's dreams. And as President Clinton likes to say, as we try to change the world, we can still commit to get caught trying. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panelists. President and CEO, Western Union, Hikmet Ersek. <laughs> Prime Minister Sweden, Stefan Löfven. Her Majesty, Queen Rania Al Abdullah, Queen of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And our moderator, President and CEO, International Rescue Committee, David Miliband. 
Well, good afternoon, everyone. We've got an absolutely stellar uh, panel, as you can see, and we're going to get straight into it because we've got... Um, Oh, it's just gone up by two minutes. We've just been given, we've made such a good start that we've been given two extra minutes uh, to uh, get through um, this really challenging topic. Uh, Queen Rania of Jordan, obviously Jordan has been an extraordinary host for 650,000 registered refugees and up to 600,000 more. Um, the Prime Minister of Sweden is here not because Sweden is one of the most dangerous places in the world or one of the toughest places in the world, but uh, the Prime Minister of Sweden is here because Sweden is an exemplary international aid donor, and last year welcomed 160,000 refugees to the country. And I'm delighted too that Hikmet Erzeg, whose company has 90% of its customers as some of the poorest people in the world, is going to reflect on his experience too and his company's experience. Uh, the discussion is going to be divided into three parts. We'll start uh, with the challenges that have been confronted in, in Jordan, uh, how Sweden sees them, and then the Western Union, uh, some of the lessons and then talk about the partnerships going forward that can help make progress for some of the displaced people who are in the headlines every day. Uh, Queen Rania, let's start with you and Jordan's uh, experience. I think it's fair to say that five years ago, many people thought that there would be a temporary influx of people from Syria and from the Syrian civil war into, into Jordan. It's become a seemingly permanent fixture of national life. Could you talk to us a bit about uh, how the country has faced that challenge and the nature and scope of the challenge? Well, you know, the, the main challenge is the overwhelming scale of the crisis and the disproportionate global response to it. So um, we live in a time where every minute 24 people are becoming refugees, and that's up tenfold from a decade ago. And unfortunately, most of those, most of these people end up in countries that are least equipped to host them. So the six wealthiest nations in the world that account for 60% of the global economy, they host less than 9% of the world's refugees. More than half are hosted by countries like Jordan that make up less than 2% of the world economy. So as you mentioned, in Jordan, uh, we have 1.3 million refugees. And if you take into account the refugees that came from Iraq and Palestine beforehand, 20% of our population are refugees. And that has had a devastating impact on our economy, infrastructure, services. So we've had to share our classrooms, hospital beds, uh, uh, housing, and jobs with refugees. So it's really overwhelmed our capacity uh, to cope and really stretched us to the limit. And only 35% of the cost of hosting refugees comes from the international community. The rest of it, we've had to cover from our own budget. So a good quarter of our budget goes to uh, covering refugees, and our debt to GDP ratio now is up to 94%. So it has had a, a devastating impact on, on, on us, and, and the main challenge is to get people to change their mode of thinking, to looking for more long-term sustainable solutions that don't just focus on aid and relief, but rather on, on development and investment uh, and to give them a, a longer ray of hope. Can you say a bit about the educational challenge, because I know that's something that you're very passionate about. 40% uh, I think of the refugees arriving in Jordan are under the age of 18. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a massive educational uh, challenge for young boys and girls. Well, you know, uh, research shows that um, we learn more in the first five years of our lives than any other time. So the experiences that we have in, in those formative years really shape the adults that we become. Every single child under the age of five in, in Syria has known nothing but a lifetime of war and, and, and trauma. So that is 3.7 million children. And you know, they have lost, they've had their childhoods taken, stolen away from them. That's something we can never give them back, but we're at risk of them losing their adulthoods if they, they don't go to school. In Jordan, we have 145,000 kids in our schools and we're expanding now to take hundreds of thousands more. But our classrooms have become overcrowded. Our teachers are overwhelmed. We've had to do double shifts in some of our schools, which has meant that it's less instruction time and the education is being compromised for both Jordanians and Syrians. So that is a great concern of mine. And I know that when people look at the refugee crisis, they always focus on the immediate issues, the urgent issues, the political ramifications. What keeps me up at night is thinking of what future generation are we creating today? Um, you know, are we creating a generation that is consigned to poverty, uh, to stunted potential, to limited opportunities? Uh, are, are we creating a generation 
that is more vulnerable to radicalization. So are we creating a world that is more dangerous in 10 years' time than it is today? That is something that we really, really have to think about. We can't just keep thinking of aid and relief and survival. We really have to think of what kind of future are we creating for not just our region, but the entire world. Prime Minister, one of the things that is striking is that we often see references to a European refugee crisis. But of course, the message from Jordan and from Lebanon and from Turkey is that this has been a crisis for a long time, well before it hit the headlines. Can you talk a bit about the European perspective on this and what you think needs to change about the way Europeans are engaging with this global challenge? Yeah, uh, what we need to do more is to recognize that uh, we, we Europeans, Americans, Australians, we tend to think that all the refugees are arriving in, in our home turf, which, which is not true. I visited in, in August the Satari campaign in Jordan, and I had the pleasure of meeting the king as well, discussing the, the, the situation. And we can nothing but applaud uh, what Jordan is doing, Lebanon, Turkey, and uh, not only applaud, but we also need to make an effort to, to support in a better way. Sweden has adopted a, a strategy for, for Syria and the, and the neighboring countries uh, uh, where we need to improve the daily lives for these refugees because it is crucial, of course, that they, that they uh, are given shelter, protection, uh, roof over their head, food, water, all these basic things. But now we need to take the step to make sure that these children also can get an education. So we need to add more resources. And these people, um, they, the only thing they want is to peace and go home. They want to, to see their families again. So during this these, these time, we, as, as global actors, need to give them a better uh, daily life. So uh, more resources to, to the countries in the neighboring areas is so important, and I'm very glad that President Obama has taken the initiative. He's taken to, so tomorrow there will be a refugee summit hosted by, by President Obama, but also co-hosted by Jordan, Sweden, Germany, Mexico, Ethiopia, Canada. Uh, so showing that we want to take a lead in this issue. In this issue. So we acknowledge all the refugees are not in our countries, they are in other countries, in the neighboring countries, to uh, increase the support. Uh, this isn't just a policy challenge, it's a political challenge as well, in every country, not just in Western countries. Uh, and balancing the needs of refugees and host communities is something that's challenging everywhere. Can you say a bit about how you're handling the politics uh, in a European country with a diverse set of political actors? Tell us how you're balancing the policy and the politics. Well, first, we, we stay firm that we, we need to show solidarity in, in these days. We had the, 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 the worst refugee crisis since the Second World War. Uh, and then, it, it, to underline, it is, once again, it is a global challenge. It's not a challenge for a few countries or one continent. It's a global challenge, and we need to, to take that into, into consideration. And what we need to raise the awareness about is that if, if one region is affected badly, it will affect us eventually. So it's a good thing, it's a moral right thing to do, but it's also a smart thing to do for all countries to support, because otherwise, I mean, look at the Syria conflict, what, it, what has happened to the surrounding countries and how the, all this has affected uh, Europe and other parts of the world. And the same goes for Africa. The situation there, we see all the people coming up from Africa because they cannot make their living in their own countries and they cannot stay in the neighboring countries. So, so uh, building on both solidarity but also more smart economic uh, arguments, uh, we, we can argue with, with the, uh, our people that this is a smart thing to do. Hikmet, you've uh, taken some initiatives including having some zero fee transfers for refugees the long-term nature of the conflicts that we're dealing with means that there has to be a private sector contribution as well as a public sector contribution to addressing this. Uh, when did this come onto your radar and, and how do you see it? Well, <clears throat> that's true. We do zero fees for refugees to support them because we believe that long-term they need the cash to, turn, to support their families. And it's not about immediate making money and, you know, 
being uh, immediate return. It's really long-term investment, which you really help the society, also the business. But putting that aside, this is, we call it global crisis now because it's impacted the West now. The refugee and migrant crisis have been always here. And we, if it would be only uh, in Jordan or in Lebanon or in Turkey, we would call it regional crisis. Now, because the many million people are moving to West, it came to attention, now we call it um, global crisis. The Western Union have been in 200 countries and we see that daily where the people are moving cross-border and have to leave the countries because of disaster, because of war, because of terrorism, whatever the reason is. But one thing they need is always, they think, as you said, Prime Minister, they want to support their families. The number one reason, we do 31 transactions a day. Uh, second, we do about 2.5 million transactions a day. And the number one reason why people send money back home, regardless if they make the first dollar, is education for their kids. They want to send the money back home to their kids that they can go to a school. So it is very much related that you do support, the, in that case, the Syrian refugees. We could see that how they left Syria, Turkey, Greece, Bosnia, all the way, Austria, Germany, to Sweden. And you could follow how their relatives in Sweden were supporting uh, them to buy a bus ticket in Bosnia that they could go really to Sweden. So, it's essential that the private sector is a part of the policy, it's part of the crisis, and we do our part of that and not ignoring on that. And, you know, our customers are not the luxury. They don't drive a Rolls Royce, they don't drive a Mercedes, they really go by foot, take their buses, and I think it's, uh, it's, I'm fortunate that I could lead this company which we could support them. And do you happen to know what's the average level of a remittance or a monthly remittance that's sent through Western Well, Union? the average amount is about $300, but in this crisis, it was about $100 because the people didn't have more, much money, right? It's $300, and, you know, we move billions of dollars uh, actually worldwide. There's about $700 billion moved yearly on remittances, and it's far higher than any FDI, far higher than any investment. The remittances, the, the direct help to the people is... Uh, it's essential. One thing I would like to mention also, because NGOs are there, we have a thing called, and Raj asked me that before, we have a thing called NGO pay. We have 900 NGO uh, signed with that. Means that a teacher in Africa or an aid helper in, uh, in somewhere worldwide gets the money directly. So what we do is that we take the, uh, take the funds, distribute direct to the rural areas that the people continue can teach or you know do the health um, health exercise, and that's something that it's important, and that's moving money ma makes better things happen. Thanks. Your Majesty, we're tremendously honored at the International Rescue Committee because you've agreed to join our board. Among your many accomplishments, you can add that to your, uh, to your list of accomplishments. Um, and I think one of the things that inspired you was visiting our work both in Greece and in uh, Jordan. And at a time when the biggest danger that we all face is that people think the problems are too big to make a dent, I think it would be really worthwhile for the audience to hear from you some of the things that you've seen in Jordan and elsewhere that inspire you to see what difference can be made and how the story can be of solutions and not just of suffering. Well, you know, I, I think, first of all, that we need to, you know, recast the global debate on uh, refugees, you know. This is a responsibility for everybody. And uh, it's, the word refugee has become so politicized and the narrative around refugees has become so polarizing when at the heart of it are people who are really suffering. It is about human tragedy and human suffering. And it's heartbreaking to see that something that is so fundamentally humanitarian has been transformed into something political to get you know, popularity and to get votes. At the end of the day, this is about people. It's about people who've lost everything through no fault of their own. And we need to be there for them. And when you, um, unfortunately, it, it took images of young children's bodies being washed up on shore, uh, as we saw a year ago with Alain's body, or a, a couple of months ago, the five-year-old in Aleppo who was sitting in the back of an ambulance, so shell-shocked that not even the sight of his own blood fazed him. Uh, those kinds of images strip the politics away from this, and they make us realize that this is about human beings and um, you know sadly though even though there was a public outcry and the world was shocked 
but it didn't mobilize the world because a year later, I think little has changed in the world's appetite in dealing with refugees in a meaningful way. So instead, all we see is a, is a you know, people are just have become numb to crisis and there is a weary resignation to the plight of refugees and we can't afford to lose focus. I was at a session this morning at the UN, uh, a summit on refugees and migrants, and I was saying that we shouldn't be confused by the label refugee crisis. This is not a crisis just about refugees. This is about our future, all of us. It is, you know, the situation with refugees is both a, a byproduct of our interconnected world and it is a test of its durability. Are we going to find an effective way to deal with the situation and make it work for us, or are we going to let it pull us apart, polarize our politics and our populations, and make us retreat in our own trenches at a very high cost to our experience of the world around us and of human progress? So, you know, we really need to recast this debate. Um, Prime Minister, the, um, can you pick up this theme about how to address the dehumanization of refugees, the statistics, 25 million refugees, the danger is that they are dehumanized. Uh, in the Swedish model of integration of refugees into national life, how do you, how do you bring it back to the individual scale? Well, uh, we, um, we uh, I've said this, I, I'm, I, am, I would prefer to be a prime minister in a country that is growing compared to shrinking. Now, we, we receive people from other countries now with some of them, I mean, there are doctors, there are engineers, nurses, uh, computer uh, experts. Uh, some of them uh, have vocational training, some of them less training. We need to, to treat them as individuals. But if they are approved as uh, uh, refugees in Sweden, we want to make sure that they can go on with their lives as they want to do we want the same thing. All of us want to provide ourselves, make ourselves uh, our own living, make sure that the family can, can develop, the kids go to school and everything. All human beings want that. Basically, I mean, I, I've, I've met so many people around the world since my time as a trade unionist, and every time I talk to a people from another part of the world, I find this common interest of developing a good life. Can I just add one thing? I think it's important for us you now to... to, to recognize this refugee, the, the task that we have together. It's a global responsibility, as your majesty is pointing out so correctly. But we need to think, how can we prevent people from having to flee? We need to think also, what can we do more in these to, to prevent conflicts, to eradicate poverty and hunger, to make sure that more uh, children can go to school where they live, and all these things. And today we have a few number of countries in the world, few, that actually contributes with 0.7% uh, uh, of their GDP to, to this uh, uh, um, aid, the international aid development. Few countries. We need to increase those. Because if we can help one another at the global scale, more people don't have to flee in the first time. And they don't want to flee their homes. They want to stay home. Let's make sure that they can do that. Great. Uh, Hikmet, uh, if there's one thing that you could ask your private sector peers here to do, what would it be coming out of this session? They've heard about the, the degree of need. They've heard about the potential and about the need to treat these people as human beings. What's the biggest thing that this audience can go and do? Well, <clears throat> for the private sector, what I would suggest is that... Um, you have to understand the need. I mean, we are pretty good to understand need of the customers, but it comes to the needs of the refugees, we just ignore them. Uh, we just look over because they are not sexy enough. They are not uh, customers that we can make immediate money. We forget uh, that uh, we are talking about a global crisis. We are not involving also on our side the politicians. We are not lo uh, lobbying with them. Because, you know, one of the issues in the politicians, with all respect, Mr. Prime Minister, is that you guys are uh, voted by local people, but you are responsible for global issues. And this is a global issue. And, you know, people like you stand up and start initiatives, but we have to do more on that. And you, I, what I'm, uh, you know, tomorrow at the, um, Mr. Obama's uh, call to action, Mr. President's call to action, I'm also there. It's really the uniqueness of 
standing with the refugees and uh, not ignoring them is something that understanding their needs and really thinking on a long term instead of short term returns is something that we all private sector have to do it and really finding the opportunities for us. Uh, Your Majesty, I think it's probably right to give you the uh, last word and maybe the same question. What would you ask this audience to go away and do? They've listened. What do you want them to do? Well, first of all, I want them to, just a simple reminder that nobody chooses to be a refugee. A refugee is something you become when you run out of choices. I think that's a basic thing that people just forget that. And I think... Uh, you know, when you're talking about our leaders, one thing that I find frustrating is that looking around the world, most leaders are stuck in linear modes of thinking and in traditional approaches, or they're consumed by very urgent issues that, you know, like votes and, and short-term politics, that they don't think of the um, disruptions that are happening in the world and the effects that they're going to have uh, on us in the future. So we end up staying in that same cycle. At the end of the day, it is about people and values. We have to create a future that works for all of us by putting people front and center and giving them the opportunity to, to be empowered and to, to live a dignified life. And I think everybody in the audience here has a role to play. We can all do something for refugees. You know, you have institutions like the IRC. There are so many ways to help. And, um, you know, the needs are great. And it is... Each one of us here should take this as a personal issue because whenever there is a person who's d deprived of opportunity in life and ends up with nothing to lose, that person could one day be a danger to us. So it is a personal issue. And each one of us has to try to do something, however small, to help those people who need so much. And you know, I, I say that you know, as young kids, everybody at some point in their life was told, treat others as you'd want to be treated, right? We all heard that from a young age. And there's a very good reason. It's because it's something that we can instinctively grasp because it touches the core of our humanity and it's universal. It applies to anyone, anywhere, in any situation. You can't go wrong by living by it. But the question is, are we living by it? Is this how we would want to be treated if we were in such a desperate situation? I think what we're really facing today is not a crisis, a uh, refugee crisis. It's a crisis of values and I think a deficit of moral leadership. Well, look, that is a um, tremendously well, put, as someone who's leading a humanitarian organization, I often get asked about humanitarian emergencies. And I often say, look, the truth is that it's a political emergency more than a humanitarian emergency. Let me just finish on this uh, note. When people say something is a global crisis, it can often sound like it's out there or a long way away. But the truth about the refugee crisis is that it's in every town and city around the world today. Any of us can be a mentor or a volunteer to a local refugee resettlement agency that's working to ensure the successful integration of people into national life. You don't have to be a major global decision maker. It helps when they are doing the right thing. So I hope the lesson that we take away is that this isn't just a problem that's out there. It's a problem that's in here, and it's one that we all have to address together. Please join me in thanking the panel for this very interesting discussion. In 2014, President Clinton issued a call to action on the Syrian refugee crisis, urging CGI members to respond not only to the immediate humanitarian needs, but to also consider the mid to long term infrastructure priorities in sectors such as education and health. As the majority of Syrian refugees who have fled to neighboring countries do not live in camps but in host communities, which places considerable strain on governments, CGI encouraged members to focus on commitments that benefit both host communities and refugees. More than a dozen members have responded and have made a series of commitments, particularly in Jordan in partnership with the government. These efforts include building schools to help alleviate strains on educational systems in host countries, providing access to healthcare, including mental health, and by providing income-generating opportunities. 
As the average stay in a refugee camp is now 17 years, and the lives of both refugees and host communities are dramatically impacted by displacement, it is imperative that our efforts focus on the long term. Through CGI, these members have not only addressed the immediate needs caused by the Syrian civil war, but have also identified enduring solutions that reflect the priorities of the region. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Executive Editor and CEO, News Deeply, Laura Satrakian. When CGI asked me to announce these commitments, I had no idea they would hit so close to the heart. To get us started, I'd like to invite to the stage Carlo Cimbri of Unipol Gruppo Financiario, Leonello Boscardi of the UN Refugee Agency, Mace Balki of Syria Relief and Development, Charlie Benjamin of the Near East Foundation, Jennifer Holt of Building Markets, Michelle Mordassini, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, Sarah Costa of the Women's Refugee Commission, Nancy Aosi from the International Medical Corps, Renato Cortesini of the Kairos Rainbow Group, Thomas Colhane of Solar Cities, Frank Giustra of the Radcliffe Foundation, and Ken Harbo of Team Rubicon. I think the size of the group reflects the magnitude of their commitment and the importance of the work they're doing. As you heard in the film, since 2014, members of the CGI community have mobilized to meet the needs of nearly 5 million Syrian refugees living in Jordan, as well as Turkey, Lebanon, Iraq, and Egypt. The individuals standing before you on the stage are here to announce commitments that will address challenges that Syrians and other refugees face following their displacement and the challenges they encounter in their host communities and the challenges their host communities face accommodating them and giving them a brighter future. Several commitments will address the healthcare crisis. Since war erupted in Syria in 2011, more than one half of the hospitals and health clinics in Syria have ceased to function. There's a severe shortage of medical professionals. Meanwhile, over 11 million people in Syria are in need of urgent health services. The global platform for Syrian students and its partners will establish a scholarship program for medical students, those displaced from Syria who want to continue their studies. It will also support specialist training programs for doctors still in Syria. Unipol and the UNHCR will provide funding and in-kind support for medical care for refugees. They'll be reaching refugees in Lebanon who might have access to health care but still need additional treatment for emergency or life-saving health conditions. Five commitments will focus efforts on improving access to educational and employment opportunities in Syria and in various host countries. Syria Relief and Development will provide financial support, technology, and curriculum development for students in the fields of pharmacy, engineering, agriculture, and education, fields that are desperately needed to build the future of Syria. The International Medical Corps, in partnership with Hewlett Packard, will enhance access to financial literacy and education through skills and technology training, mentorship programs, and links to employers in Turkey. Kairos Rainbow will address the large refugee population in Italy with both integration services and job placement training programs. Building Markets and the Near East Foundation will provide business development and employability skills training in Jordan, for both Jordanians and Syrian and Iraqi refugees living there. The Women's Refugee Commission and its partners will work to move women out of cash assistance programs into paying jobs, to build women's employment capacity, and to develop programs aimed at helping support women and girls who are either entering or already in the workplace in Jordan, Turkey, and Lebanon. 
as the availability of safe shelter and basic services is one of the first challenges refugees face, the Radcliffe Foundation will provide accommodations to refugees living in Greece by helping to finance the leasing of apartments and the managing of basic expenses. Its partner, Team Rubicon, will provide medical services, including immunizations, to all residents. And in the Zaatari refugee camp in Jordan, Solar Cities will install two biogas digesters to provide renewable energy while eliminating waste. The International Fund for Agricultural Development will raise $100 million in new funds for agricultural training, financial access, and adaptation technologies to help numerous countries with large populations of refugees and displaced communities. They'll be helping countries like Jordan, Lebanon, Sudan, and Tunisia to become more resilient in the face of this crisis. These commitments will all offer a ray of hope to people whose lives have been turned upside down in unthinkable ways. Please join me in applauding this remarkable group of people. Now I'd like to invite to the stage Ulrich Gaylord of Beatty Relief Alliance, whose commitment has come in partnership with Direct Relief. Big challenges require big partnerships with big groups of people, so happy to see that. On February 1st of this year, the World Health Organization declared the Zika virus to be a public health emergency and called for a coordinated response to minimize the threat in affected locations around the world while reducing the risk of further spread. Since 2007, evidence of the Zika virus have been documented in 72 countries and territories, including 55 locations in the past year alone. Originally thought to be exclusively transmitted by mosquitoes, the virus has been also proven to be sexually transmitted person to person. As 20 countries or territories have reported neonatal microcephaly, other malformations believed to be associated with the Zika virus have also been documented. Pregnant women and those in their childbearing years are of particular concern. This new commitment, Zika Prevention and Care, will launch Zika intervention programs in Argentina, the Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Jamaica, Venezuela, and in the United States, specifically in Puerto Rico, Florida, and Texas, all areas reporting incidences of Zika. Considering the most vulnerable populations, the multifaceted response will include reproductive health and family planning services, prenatal care, and the dissemination of information regarding Zika and its risks. Zika modules to be distributed in the target locations will include the tools to perform basic diagnostics on pregnant women, screen for microcephaly, and bolster efforts to promote healthy pregnancies. Local partners will be trained on the use and distribution of supplies such as insect repellent, biodegradable mosquito traps, and contraceptives as well as portable ultrasound equipment, fetal Dopplers, and digital thermometers. As we've discussed earlier today, the CGI community is uniquely qualified to make the short and long-term investments needed to respond to health crises. The many lessons we're learning from the recent Ebola epidemic will no doubt prove valuable in our efforts to fight Zika. Please join me in thanking Yulrik and his organization and its partners.
In many countries, people with disabilities are typically institutionalized. They're separated from their families and communities and deprived of the opportunity to lead meaningful and productive lives. In 2013, Keystone Human Services made a CGI commitment to improve social and financial inclusion for women and girls with disabilities in the United States and Eastern Europe, specifically in Pennsylvania, Moldova, and Russia. Through this commitment, Keystone seeks to move young women with disabilities from state institutions to community homes to provide them with community-based support structures. They also seek to reduce obstacles to employment for women with disabilities as well as women caregivers of children with disabilities. It's my pleasure to introduce two very special disability rights activists from the Republic of Moldova to speak about what this commitment has meant for them. Please join me in welcoming Tamara Andreas and Ludmila Yalbo. Este dificil să fii o tânără, un oricare, cu oricare dezabilitate. Dar noi, dar noi încercăm să schimbăm această situație. Eu învăț cum să-mi revindic dreptul la muncă. În prezent, în prezent, în prezent sunt în căutarea unui loc de muncă. Merg la reprezentanții autorităților publici, la angajatori, discut cu semenii mei cu care s-au confruntat cu aceeași probleme. Visul meu este să, să fiu angajată, să nu depind totalmente de familia mea. Visez să-mi pot și eu ajuta părinții pe părinții mei cum mă ajută și ei pe mine. Vreau ca, oamenii, vreau ca oamenii să înțeleagă că și persoanele cu dizabilități au abilități și că suntem și noi în societate și că avem aceleași drepturi ca și ceilalți. Acum vreau să vă o prezint pe mentora mea, Ludmila Jalbă, o persoană susținătoare și respectată în drepturile persoanelor cu dizabilități. În calitate de mamă a unui copil cu dizabilități, am învățat cât de dificilă este viața în Moldova. Ca și în multe alte țări de altfel. Cu puțin suport și puține speranțe pentru viitor. Dizabilitatea este universală, iar oamenii discriminatorii. Dizabilitatea afectează toate etniile, toate vârstele, toate culturile și grupurile socioeconomice. Nimeni nu este imun. 
chiar și să iubești pe cineva cu dizabilități are un preț. Am lăsat-o pe fica mea, Angelina, acasă, în pofida practicii instituționalizării, când deseori copiii și adulții cu dizabilități erau separați de comunități, de familiile lor, de persoanele pe care le iubesc. Dar totuși, noi politici inclusivi au fost adoptate în Republica Moldova. Ca de exemplu, legea privind incluziunea socială a persoanelor cu dizabilități, strategia de incluziune socială a persoanelor cu dizabilități. Iar serviciile de suport din comunitate au făcut ca fica mea să aibă o viață obișnuită. Angelina merge la școală, are prieteni, iar succesele ei personale sunt uluitoare. Acestea m-au făcut să-mi dezvolt propriile abilități în calitate de persoană care susține persoanele cu dizabilități. Și mă simt acum mai împlinită ca oricând în viață. Datorită Keystone Human Service, prin angajamentul lor asumat față de Clinton Global Initiative, Familia mea este un exemplu viu, că viața în comunitate poate fi responsabilă, social, viabilă, financiar și liberă, practică. Este corect să faci acest lucru pentru persoanele cu dizabilități, familiile lor și comunități. După ani de pledorie și eforturi comune, sunt mândră astăzi să vă comunic că în Republica Moldova legislația tratează în măsură egală atât persoanele cu abilități cât și persoanele cu dizabilități. Iar incluziunea socială se referă mai ales la femeile și tinerele care suferă încă prea des de dubla discriminare. În încheiere aș vrea să vă spun că dacă mi s-ar fi dat șansa să-mi aleg copii, tot un copil cu dizabilitate mi-aș fi ales. Doar experiența de a avea un copil cu dizabilitate m-a făcut să învăț cât, ce este cu adevărat important în viață. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome student and education activist Mazun Almalehan. And welcome back our moderator, Laura Satrakian. There are many reasons I love Mazun Al-Malhan, and one of them is that she gives me the chance to look up to someone who's practically half my age. <laughs> Mazun is evidence that you can be both a refugee and a role model. At 18 years old, she left Syria at the, at the, in ninth grade, I believe, and is already four years into a lifelong career as an education advocate. She lived and worked as an advocate in multiple refugee camps, convincing families to keep their daughters in school instead of marrying them off, asking them, please let them pursue an education instead. There are at least 3.5 million refugee children around the world who don't have a chance to go to school. The majority of the 400,000 refugees in Lebanon, for example, aren't able to get an education. And what Mazun and I have talked about is not only is it vital to consider the need for them to get an education, but what happens to them if they don't. She and I have both documented cases of kids ending up working just to feed their families, some of them ending up in prostitution, and others at risk of trafficking and exploitation. Mzun is working for the welfare of those children. She's lived through Syria's brutal war, and yet she's a hard-working optimist who believes in her dreams 
and in the future of her country. Muzun, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you so much to all for this great uh, chance to speak and share my story and experience. Thank you very much for all. What do you tell these girls and what do you tell their families? How do you convince them that the right thing to do is to stay in school? Actually, uh, it was so hard to uh, convince these people because, you know, uh, sometimes it's so hard to speak to the people because uh, their cultures, traditions, they think the girl should uh, not go to school. They think the education, it is not the priority. So uh, it was so hard in the beginning, but I told myself, never give up. I should start. When I will start, I can do something. Also, I can change. I know a change is difficult, but not impossible. So I started my campaign inside the camp to uh, tell girls and boys to uh, come back to school. Uh, so uh, first I started inside my classes in the school, started to uh, meet the girls and sit with them to tell them about education. Also to tell them without education, we cannot doing something. So first we should get our right of education then we can do anything we want. Because if we lost our right of education, then we cannot do anything, not for ourselves or for our country as well. So um, then I started to do that widely uh, inside my school, then uh, outside my school, in the, uh, inside the camp from 10 to 10. I went to tell the people about education, to give them uh, some advice about education to send their children to school. I spoke with their parents as well because, you know, sometimes uh, they have the influence from their uh, parents because uh, some children, if they saw, uh, their parents think the education, it is not important. So then the child maybe will say the education, it is not important. So I was uh, caring uh, a lot about to speak with parents because they have the impact on their children. Uh, also, I spoke with girls and boys to uh, think deeply about their future. Our future is our education. So also, I told them we want to do something for our country. Our country needs to very strong people. Uh, these strong people, they will be by education. Also, I told them if you uh, love your children, you should send them to school. School is power. School is everything. So uh, we need to education because Syria needs us. Syria needs to engineers, doctors, teachers, to everyone who can be positive for Syria. You went to a UNICEF school. In one of your classrooms, you saw four, a classroom of 40 students become 20 students because half of them left. What happened to the ones who didn't stay in school? You know, uh, when I was in the camp, uh, most of the girls, especially the girls, they were just uh, the, leave the school to get married. The marriage was, is the biggest problem inside the camp. So um, I met a lot of girls who uh, leave the school just to get married. They think that marriage is better than education. It's the best protection. Also, you know, their, their parents, the same thing. Also, uh, the, uh, the most uh, people in the community think that marriage is better than education because, you know, uh, because the old cultures and the traditions in the past, uh, the girls sh just should to, um, get uh, married and just to be in the house. So uh, most of them left their schools, you know, for get uh, marriage. Uh, it was a uh, very negative thing. Uh, so, you know, uh, it was really bad uh, thing to see girls like me and my age, just they want to get married and they don't think about education because uh, if everyone will think uh, the marriage is the best, nobody will do something. So uh, we need to all each other and we don't need just one person educated. We need to every child in the community because uh, without education, we are nothing. Uh, if I want to think education, uh, it is not important for me. Maybe anyone will do the education. So then we will lose um, this generation. Also, you know, the children are the foundation of communities. Without uh, children, we, uh, we cannot do anything. So if the children are not educated people. Who will rebuild our country? 
So I, saw the, uh, I was really sad to see girls like me, they, just think, they don't think about education, just think to get married. So this is very bad. You were telling me you were very sad because you saw a lot of those marriages were then not successful and they were left with very little to work with. Um, how do you see the reintegration of those girls? How can they be brought back into education and into the future of Syria? You know, uh, uh, basically it is a very bad thing to see. Uh, uh, nobody think about uh, thinks about education. Uh, so you know. Uh, also, sometimes uh, you you uh, you say that, yeah. When the girl got married, maybe uh, then she uh, she think that education. Uh, she thinks the education it is not important. Then when she g uh, get divorced, that's very bad because she uh, first she lost her education. Then she cannot face uh, anything in her life. Maybe she cannot face uh, her challenges. Uh, also, the um, hardest thing, um, it's, uh, it's so hard to come back to school because uh, when she got mar uh, married, maybe she brought children. Then maybe her uh, family, they cannot accept her or they cannot help her. So uh, in this uh, case, the, the girl in the small age, she lost everything, especially the education. So I told them, first, we should get an education, then we can do anything. For example, if I got in my education, then if I face any problem, like if uh, my marriage uh, goes unsuccessful or if I had anything, then by education, I can rebuild my life. I can fix everything. So, uh, you know, by uh, first education, then we can do anything. So you were, <laughs> you were doing this work as an advocate. You were going to school, studying in a tent every day, and you met Malala. And she and you have now been working to help girls in many countries, not just Syria, Nigeria, Pakistan, Somalia. You're working together for millions of girls. What do they need most? What are the things that you would like to give them if you had all the money in the world? Actually, you know, it's uh, uh, great to meet a girl like Malala because now she, uh, she is like a symbol of education. So that's amazing to work with her. Not just we want to support the children of Syria. I'm not just uh, uh, talking about the uh, Syrian children. I, I'm talking about every child who lost the right of education because uh, every child has the chance to get an education. Because if I have war or conflicts in my country or in any place around the world, that's not my fault to lose my rights. So uh, I, we want to work together to fight for the right of education. So uh, I, uh, we need to be able to hear us, especially we want to the uh, uh, support from the governments and to the people who can help. Maybe sometimes I love education, but I don't have a chance to get in my education because I don't have the uh, support. So uh, I cannot do uh, uh, anything alone. We need to work together. We should stand together, not just for Syrian children. Um, uh, we, we want the right of education for every child around the world. So that's amazing to work with a girl like Malal to fight for the, uh, the uh, precious thing of life. It is the education, basic human right. You have in this room amazing leaders in business and government. You're here speaking at the UN. What do you want to tell them? How can they help you? In fact, I want to, uh, my message is to the world leaders and the people here, I want them to think deeply about the children, especially the Syrian children, uh, to think about their dreams and hopes, also about their rights, especially the education, because we are the future. We are Syria. Syria it is just a country, but Syria will be uh, rebuilt by the children, not uh, the children who are very educated people. So uh, we don't want to be victims. We can do something. We can change. We can uh, uh, fight for our rights. We are not the children, or we, uh, not just we have the name uh, refugees. I'm refugees, but I'm Muzun. Uh, I'm talking about millions of children around the world. So uh, we, we have the same rights of all the children to get in, 12, uh, 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 in our education, especially the uh, 12 years of education. So we need your help. We should stand together for solve this uh, crisis. 
uh, I, uh, uh, that's right, many of the people say, maybe we want just to support the, uh, the refugees and people who uh, have conflicts and war in the food or shelters or safe places. That's right, that's a very important thing. But we need more, we need our education. We are not just refugees or uh, we lost our hopes and the dreams. We still keep our hope and the dreams. So we want help for help many of these children all over the world to uh, come back to their schools because now maybe you are giving me the food and shelters but in the future i will be lost my education so then i cannot do anything i will still need help from you but if you give me my education as you give me my future then i can bring the food and shelters and safe place by my education so we need the education education it comes first uh, if I'm refugee or I'm not refugee, I have a right to get an education. Every ch child should go, uh, get in the right of education. So what are your dreams? What do you want to do with your education? What are your dreams for the future? My dream is, uh, as Muzon, I want to be a journalist, but also uh, I will still fight for the right of education for IFAR. Because education, it is not just important for uh, just for now. Education is important uh, in any time and the place. So uh, I want to work uh, for my uh, for the education. Also, I will do uh, uh, all my best for the education and to see every child all over the world in the school. A year ago, you moved to the UK with your family. You took your GCSEs, you're preparing for your A-levels, you learned incredible English. Tell us a bit about the experience. What's been the best part and what's been the hardest part of your adjustment to a new life? In fact, it's so hard to change from a place to another. For example, I, first I left my country, I lived in two refugee camps, so it's a big change to uh, first to live in your country, then to uh, move to live in the camps. You know, the camp is uh, it's very difficult place to manage your life, to uh, fight for education. Then I moved to the UK, so I, in fact, you know, everything in the beginning, it's so hard, then by day by day, it started to be easier. First, uh, in fact, when I arrived to the UK, it was a bit difficult uh, in the school to understand the system of education of the UK, also to know new friends, and uh, also to uh, uh, manage my studying, to know which uh, subjects I want to do. So it was, yeah, a bit difficult because I, uh, I haven't uh, enough information about studying in the UK, so it was a bit tricky uh, last year when I uh, came very late to school to um, do my exams. So I studied very hard to, I did my best to get in good results. Then now uh, this year, I consider it it's a serious uh, year for me. I'm studying very hard to get in high results. So, you know, as I, uh, I told you, the education is, uh, it comes first. So I should study very hard to, uh, for I, I hope to go to university and complete my education. Then I hope to come back to Syria and do something. I want to be positive for Syria. I hope so in the future. When you're... <laughs> you, you got an A plus in Arabic in your GCSEs. And I know that because it was in the newspaper. You're so famous now that your grades are being published in the newspaper. So I'm sure you'll do extremely well going forward. Please join me in thanking Muzun for being with us today. Thank you, Dara. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, the plenary session is now concluded. Your next sessions will begin at 3.45 p.m.